I'd like to start by introducing you to Marilyn Ray Beyer. Marilyn comes from Lexington, born in Lansing, Illinois. As a child, she loved sock hops and skating and reading out loud and seeing classic movies with her mother. She found the love of using her voice in fourth grade when she hosted a school library pageant. And in high school, she competed in oral reading contests and began after her voiceover work for radio and TV commercials and as air host for folk radio WUMB, and she now co-hosts Watch City Coffee House at BRSFM. And in asking Marilyn for a favorite moment, moment in sharing poetry, uh, she sent me back to 1968 and said, at a speech contest, she read James Weldon Johnson's poem, The Creation. And she said, there were three Amer African American young men who came up to say they really liked her reading. And then Marilyn realized, although her reading was perhaps audacious and ill-advised at that time of history, it was her first opportunity to have a conversation with a person of color. And so memorable, as their appreciation of her reading was so very tender and genuine. And obviously, it was memorable to them, the words that she had to share. And I know that they will be today as well, and I very much look forward to introducing you now to Marilyn Ray Beyer. Well, I will begin by telling you how the story I'm about to read came to the HCAM studios. Some years ago, listening to the radio in the dark wee hours of uh, a morning on the way to work, I heard a reading of an award-winning piece of prose on WGBH. Actually, it was the BBC Short Story Contest winner for 2002. The story came from Malaysia. It took me a couple of years, actually, to track down the author. But with some help from folks at WGBH and the BBC, I got in contact with him, and he gave me his personal permission to share the story. So here is, by Ridzwan Othman, A Stale Silence. She took one last look at herself. For once, the mirror said nothing. She extinguished the lamp and picked up her basket, empty and expectant. She hurried out the door, and in the early darkness, she tripped over the first silence of the day. But instead of reducing her to ruins, the stumble propelled her into the black morning, and, rather doubtfully, she took flight. Was it a triumph, she wondered, going headlong like this towards one's final moments? Triumph or not, all she could think to be was anxious, and all her anxiety could do was peek into the basket and make sure nothing had fallen out. Once on the path, she walked nervously, hoping to reach the market before six, while well, the greenest vegetables went very quickly. From experience, she also knew that there would be no point in buying any fish once the sun came up, and the market would get unbearably crowded after 6.30. Any silences still remaining would surely be gone by then. And what then if she failed? If she failed to secure the necessary items? She quickened her step. When she finally reached the market, she found to her immense relief that not all the tomatoes had been taken. There were still some good ones left. She bought five, then carefully put them away in such a way that they would not be easily bruised by irregular pockets of emptiness. She kept an eye out for the seller of silence. But since he was nowhere to be seen or heard, she continued with her marketing. From stall to stall, she moved quickly, selecting without delay, paying without haggling. From time to time, she rearranged the contents of the basket, and within 20 minutes, she had obtained bell peppers, a squid, egg noodles, and quivering tofu, the last of which had necessitated an extensive reorganization of all previous purchases. The basket was now very, very full. 
She spotted him just as she was about to go home in despair. She drew her breath in sharply. He saw her. She saw him see her. In an instant, she was clawing away at the insides of the basket, trying to get to the silences, frantically pushing the tomatoes aside and banishing them to the edge. The squid burst through its newspaper wrapping. The tofu came apart like a putrefied organ. Why had she so foolishly packed the silences underneath the food? Why? Why had she placed them at the bottom of the basket where they were, well, so very safe, but also so difficult to reach? Stupidity. She looked foolish, standing there disemboweling her basket. And when she looked up to make sure he hadn't left, of course he had. He had left. In the end, the result of her violent actions, two tomatoes fell to the ground. Now, one hemorrhaging and horribly disfigured, the other one dead. Some of the passers-by stared as they walked past her. Embarrassed and disconsolate, she turned to leave. And there he was again, beside the mushrooms, busy selling silence to someone. This time she was more prepared. She walked quickly but calmly toward him, and in a way that did not seriously intrude upon his present transaction, she made it clear to him that she would be very appreciative if she were his next transaction. He nodded politely at her, then returned to serving his customer, a young man who appeared both troubled and soothed by what he was buying. At length, this young man left, and it was her turn. She opened her mouth to speak, but the seller of silence raised his eyebrows to stop her. Then she remembered. Nobody spoke to the seller of silence, nor did he speak. At least, not out loud. He smiled at this minor blunder of hers. Nearby, two young ladies stood, looking at him and giggling. He winked at them. She frowned, wishing that he would pay more attention to her than to the ladies. She was, after all, a customer, and in any case, she did not see why his exceedingly plain looks should elicit any interest whatsoever. Yes? He asked. If you can imagine a question being asked without words, without sound, without speaking, without movement even, then you can imagine the seller of silence. Yes, he asked. She explained that she was looking for a particular kind of silence, and did he have it, she wondered. Well, what kind, he wondered. She remembered the tomatoes lying in the dirt, and she said to him, the silence that follows a final heartbeat Even then, he continued his playful exchanges with the two ladies. At this, she disintegrated a little, like the tofu. It had come to her in a very grand and novel idea, this suicide. But from the way the seller was behaving, it was clearly not the first time he had encountered such a request. Final heartbeat, eh? he asked altogether unimpressed. Yes, she said. Whose? Mine. Do you have it then? Yes, he said. At this, she heard the bits of tofu coming together magnificently. She could hear each morsel carefully falling into alignment. 
This now felt like the beginnings of a true triumph. Her plan was coming together. Right, she said, trying not to appear too excited. I, well, I don't have too much money, but I do have, well, how much would such a silence cost? She had no real experience in these matters. He smiled and said nothing. He wasn't even smiling at her. He was smiling at a group of boys who had walked past his stall and exchanged a joke with him. That didn't matter, she thought. All she wanted to do now was get the silence and leave. Do you have a will? He asked. Pardon? Are you leaving anything? To anyone. Anything to anyone. She shook her head as she reached into the basket to take out her silences, the ones she intended to give in exchange for the silence to end all silences. No. No will. No one. No fine print. No complications, please. I see. Look. I don't have much, in fact, I don't have any money, but I do have some very good silences which you would be interested in acquiring. Really? He smiled. A bartered silence. Yes. Are they from today? Pardon? Are they fresh? Instantly, her mind went back to the moment when she'd tripped over the first silence of the day. Now she regretted not having stopped to pick it up. As it were, all the silences in the basket were at least a day old. Some were downright stale. They're not fresh, she admitted. Crestfallen, she let her fingers go limp, releasing one of the silences that she had just painstakingly retrieved. It slipped back into the depths of the basket as if it were regressing into the far reaches of old age. Well, we might as well see what you have. For a moment, she suspected that he was only interested in having her display her silences so that the two ladies and he could have a roar of laughter over them. And then she realized, what did she have to lose? One by one, she took out her silences and showed them to him. Here was a symphony of cleanliness that never quite made it. A collection of notes ensnared and bleeding in the wire of a decommissioned scouring pad. And here, the black ink from the brush of a failed calligrapher, dipped into water, sinking with the speechless gravity of fireworks abandoned by their sizzle. Here, the din of thoughts colliding, careening, sliding off the tilting plane of logic. And here, the silence of a menu made for one, squid for one, tomatoes and all. Well, he said, none is equal to the silence you wish to procure. Oh, no. No, 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 she explained. I would give them all to you. Surely their combined value would be sufficient, not just one or a few, but all. Still, he shook his head. Silence. Nothing fresh at all. She shook her head. There had been something this morning, she said, the first silence of the day over which she had tripped, but she had not bothered to pick it up or even stop to examine it. Pity. <laughs> yes, well, I do have these other silences. Look, she said, the sound of squid squidding. Surely that. He laughed. Do I know you? She said, no, but I've seen you often enough every time I come to the market. You may or may not have seen me before. 
I don't know. I, I imagine not. Finally, he said, I can give you something which resembles what you asked for, a little lower in quality, but it is fresh, and you can afford it. Will it do? she wondered, hearing him describe it. Yes, he assured her, and it's fresh. It came in just today, and it will do perfectly well. And if not, you may return it, he said. Return it? Come back the following day after her failed suicide? She frowned at this joke, even though it had made her realize with a start that the seller of silence was indeed a charming man, despite his plain looks. And no wonder those two young ladies were still giggling away. You won't cheat me? No, he said. I wouldn't. And so, instead of selling her the silence that followed the final heartbeat, he sold her the silence of a breath taken away. Suffocation, strangulation, a final gasp, drowning. Whatever it was, he assured her that it was the equivalent of a final heartbeat. She took it, and in return, she gave him all her silences. And on top of that, all of her food, the squid, the tomatoes, the egg noodles, the bell peppers, the tofu. She started to walk home, her basket now empty and expectant. As she walked home, she became aware of a sound. She looked around nervously, thinking that it might be someone who had followed her from the market, someone out to rob her. Not that she had anything left except the one silence left in the basket now but there was no one. She was alone on the path. Well, she continued walking, hoping to reach home before seven. With a jolt, she realized that the sound was coming from her basket. She listened. She listened. And finally, when she felt she had to face the reality of having been cheated. She acknowledged to herself that it was the sound of fine print. Very, very exquisite fine print. Fine print attached to a silence that was by no means fresh. It was the silence of a breath taken away, but it was not suffocation nor even the sound of air growing stale. It was the silence from the very first moment I laid eyes on you and your beauty just took my breath away. Well, I thank the writer Ridzwan Othman for a stale silence. And occasionally, I write a poem or two. And usually, just like the story, there are traces of food and memory in them. This one is called Indian Apple. Every year, sometime between Halloween and Christmas, my mother bought one pomegranate, an Indian apple. She'd break the thing in two, half for me, half for you, the fruit that plays hard to get. So red, so sour, so difficult, it must be good for you. Tonight, I'm at my kitchen sink, not hungry, but wanting what's inside that thing. The knife kills a few seeds when I cut through to get it started. Then my thumbs dig in, murdering pulp until the halves are parted. Lips and teeth dig and suck until puckered, I've had enough. Hands bloodied with fresh grenadine, fingernails pink. I've had it from a bottle. It seems like cheating. A pomegranate with the experience stolen. Give me an Indian apple, 
a whole one, with a thousand seeds, each one bleeding. And I will leave you with a poem that I wrote for my best girlfriend from high school. I am the underneath. I am the underneath. You are the satin comforter. I am an afternoon nap. You are dreaming. I move. You dance. I speak. You are song. I am apple. You are pie. Ice, cream. Milk, shake. Water, melon. I am a friend. You are friendship. I am the underneath. You are the bluebird sky. Tell me old Joe spent this time They say he gave a hell of a fight We grew up close when we were kids We fought back to back Sad by side I spent my money on an old guitar I wore my heart out on my sleeve And then on both sides of the golden gate That old devil will deny But I believe I believe in the light that's in your eye I believe in the fire in your soul I believe your kindness is never die They just stole it away A hundredfold I spend my time with an old guitar I wear my heart out on my sleeve I've been on both sides of the golden gate That old devil will divide But I believe It comes in the form of your heart's desire a brilliant light from a ball of fire You spend your time and then you roll Till time divides Bone and soul I hope there's a heaven but I don't know They say you won't need a visa or a ticket to go And the girls are all pretty And the beer's all free And there's a Chevy and a levy For guys like me And I'll spend my time With an old guitar Wearing my heart out On my sleeve You may never know the seed you sow I believe in grace for guys like Joe Hey, you tell me old Joe's 
spent his time. Thank you. Another summer. When the driver in front of me slows, I lose the bird I've been tracking through the windshield. A blue heron whose vast, tattered wings beat as if somebody invisible in the sky snaps out a cloth the color of late twilight. No, looser, easier. A faded black raincoat flapping. As it flies off beyond me, I think someone has died. Her coat revisits on its own old happy places. A pond to the north in warm rain where drops dive into the surface, each acclaimed by rounds of ripple, where green is spoken in every possible shape, blade, and leaf. Somehow, I feel sure they will arrive. Heron, raincoat, woman, another summer. Jasmine.